All right, well, welcome to the show. Insane video of a man being dragged after being robbed. The bad guys aren't after money or even an expensive watch. They wanted his four-legged friend. And this is no bulldog. Well, actually, it is. They're after French bulldogs. And it's happening across the country. But first, we start with a stunning months-long operation involving multiple law enforcement agencies across Louisiana that rescued five missing and endangered teenage girls from sex trafficking rings. Several of them were found in seedy motels and apartments living with adult men. The youngest girl was just 14 years old. In Baton Rouge, the marshals saved two sisters, age 15 and 16. Operation Boudat, as it's called in a nod to the New Orleans Saints' Houdat Nation, is a joint op between the marshals, New Orleans Task Force, Louisiana State Police, and several local police departments. In addition to rescuing the teen girls and getting them home to their families and social services, the operation also netted 30 arrests. More than half of those guys were felony sex offender registration violations. One of the men arrested, 34-year-old Lorenzo Oliver, a tier three sex offender wanted by New Orleans police for the alleged rape of a 12-year-old girl. Joining me now is Sheriff Joseph Lapinto. Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, one of the agencies heavily involved in this operation. Sheriff, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Appreciate it. This um, sounds like an incredibly important operation. And so I want you to take me through some of the rescues of these girls, starting with the one, if you if you would, from your parish, a 16-year-old. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's a credible situation that we've been partnering with them and the marshals for 10 years now. The, the incident with ours is a 16 year old runaway who stole a parent's car, relative's car, a gun from the residence, and uh, really went out on Bourbon Street. Uh, we're, we're in Jefferson Parish, which is right next door to uh, Orleans Parish in New Orleans, and had ties to Bourbon Street. I uh, was living with several adults, including one female stripper. and and taking advantage of these youths uh, and really putting them in a bad situation. Uh, it gives us the opportunity when we know they're missing, when you have re relatives that report them as missing or runaway, uh, that gives us the opportunity to try to find them. And we have a 16 year old in our case, but we have a 14 and another 16 and two other 15 year olds that are uh, well, yeah. you know, in similar situations. I, w I want you to take me through each one of these because I think each one is so important. I, I gotta tell you, when I saw this story, I almost couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that I couldn't believe it, meaning I was both so horrified and so relieved at the same time about what had happened here. The fact that there was a 14-year-old girl involved, tell me about that one. You know, a 14-year-old living in the Wallens Motel uh, that's known for prostitution, you know, probably being pimped out. Uh, the, the really sad one is the 15-year-old, the which is even the worst, uh, Dan. I mean, it was a runaway. Uh, that we've been able to identify that her own pimp was murdered. Uh, and and it's, it, that's a situation where, you know, now the, the person that she's relying on to that's taking advantage of it is murdered. So where did she go afterwards? So she's living with a 17 year old, 17 uh, year old boyfriend, um, you know, meeting with adult males, obviously involved in prostitution. And it's one of those things that it's the seedier side of life that most people don't get to see. And, and we're lucky in law enforcement to really go out there and hopefully make some differences. Uh, but I mean, before, each one of those situations is, 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 is horrifying. Before I ask you about the, about the sisters, talk to me about the leads you got. Like, how did you know where to go? How did you know, um, you know that, that, that these were places where you might find some of these girls? Well, each one is different, right? I mean, law enforcement in general, the marshal service is going to be able to try to track people, whether they're on social media accounts, whether it's cell phones that we can track, whether we can figure out who their associates are. Uh, so every one of them is a little bit different. I don't necessarily have the specifics on each particular case, uh, but we work with Crime Stoppers to see what tips, working with the parents, trying to figure out where were they last, who were they last with, who do we think they're with, and then where can we locate them? Uh, where should they be? And, and those are different scenarios for each case. Tell me about the, the sisters. Um, they we're describing them as the fourth and fifth victims just because that's how it was laid out in the release from the U.S. Marshal Service. But tell us about, about those sisters. You know, both of them were missing from Baton Rouge. Uh, they uh, were found also in Baton Rouge, staying in an apartment. But, I mean, can you imagine a 15- and 16-year-old living on their own? Um, obviously living with other adults and, and being 
pimped out for their use, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, you're glad you find them. Uh, many of them made the choice to run away from their homes, but they don't understand the consequences that they can get into at that young age at, at 14, 15, and 16 years old. And, and these are the worst of the worst, finding them in these conditions and then trying to reunite them from something that they ran away from also, uh, you know, really takes a tax and toll on not only our, our system, uh, but but the, the girls themselves. And, and to be clear, some of these um, girls are going home, but some of them go to social services as well, right? Uh, that is correct. I mean, in many of the cases, uh, so they have parents that are looking for them. In other cases, they don't have parents that are looking for them. And uh, we, we're trying to buy, find the best situation for them. All right, let's talk about some of the guys who are arrested uh, here. 30, 30 guys uh, arrested. Tell me about sort of some of the, the, the worst of the worst who you got here. Well, most of them are going to have the worst of the worst, meaning they were convicted of crimes, they were registered sex offenders, and they either failed to register, they didn't show up, or they've just uh, absconded all completely. Uh, one was in a homeless shelter living under a false name. Uh, so you, you're going to have a, 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 you know, we have one that I think was a rape of a seven-year-old uh, that, you know, is, as I, was out of jail, was a registered sex offender. The crime may have happened many years ago, uh, but, but still we need to keep track of that person. And they just completely ignore the system. And so uh, that puts them back in, back behind bars as they deserve to do for their crimes that they committed. What about the guys, though, who you're finding in the hotels or the motels with these girls? Well, again, a lot of the times, you know, we know uh, what's going on, but we also are trying to prove a case based off of the witnesses from the girls that we're finding. Uh, so it, it, it takes a little bit longer because you're you're trying to do forensic interviews with with, with girls that are, are, are reliant upon these guys for their day to day operation, their day to day livelihood. And so it depends on how much cooperation we get from them, because many times they're not cooperative. Uh, because of who they dealing with on a regular basis. So uh, you know that things are going on and that's what makes this type of work very difficult. Uh, we are not there for the incident. We are there after the fact and trying to build a case uh, on, on these individuals that may or may not want to cooperate with us at all. And so although it's a rescue to us because uh, we know we're taking them out of a, a worse situation, uh, sometimes the, the crime uh, never really goes through because the witnesses that we need don't want to come forward. That must be incredibly frustrating. It, it is, Dan. And, and, and in this line of work, uh, you know, the sheriff's office uh, or any law enforcement is an agency that we put pieces together. Uh, we collect the facts and sometimes we may know what the outcome is, but we don't necessarily have the facts to be able to prove it. All right, Sheriff, um, thank you very much for your time. This is a really important operation. Um, you know, I was moved by how successful the operation was. And obviously, anytime something involves kids, you know, and in this case, it's girls, um, you know, being sexually abused, it is so heartbreaking. And it is such a relief to know uh, that you and your colleagues are out there trying to do the, the hard work to, to rescue them. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. All right. Still to come tonight. I hate to say I told you so, but... The Albany County DA is letting Andrew Cuomo off the hook, choosing not to prosecute the former governor. But here's the question. Can the sheriff who filed the charge against him still try to go it alone now? The former Republican New York Attorney General joins me next. Shocker, Andrew Cuomo is off the hook, at least criminally. The Albany County District Attorney announced today that he is not pursuing a criminal prosecution against the former New York governor for what's called forcible touching. A misdemeanor complaint was originally filed against Cuomo back in October by the Albany County Sheriff. But today, the prosecutor, who the sheriff tried to corner into a prosecution, decided to abandon it altogether. The accusation was that Cuomo had reached his hand and up and grabbed the breast of his former aide, Brittany Camisso, if that's true, that would be forcible touching. Now, if you've been watching our show, you'd know I saw it coming. I believe the sheriff went rogue. I don't know, for attention or who knows, maybe he was in cahoots with the state attorney general, Letitia James, who wanted to run for governor. But it was always absurd to me that the sheriff filed a charge without the DA who would have to prosecute the case. 
Albany DA David Soros was pretty clear from the outset that he was not going to move forward with a case against Cuomo. And today he made it official. In a statement, he said, while many have an opinion regarding the allegations against the former governor, the Albany County DA's office is the only one who has a burden to prove the elements of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt. While we found the complainant in this case cooperative and credible, after review of all the available evidence, we've concluded we cannot meet our burden at trial. As such, we've notified the court we're declining to prosecute this matter and requesting the charges filed by the Albany County Sheriff be dismissed. And the language Soros used after that suggests to me that he thinks the case against Cuomo has some major holes. Take a look at this from later in the statement. He says, I, like most New Yorkers, remain deeply troubled by allegations like the ones at issue here. Such conduct has no place in government or in any workplace, although avenues for criminal prosecution in cases are sometimes limited. I encourage victims of workplace harassment and abuse to continue to move forward and bring these issues to light so that these important discussions can continue. Now, he didn't say he was troubled by these allegations, but allegations like the ones at issue here. Gotta believe that that's just an effort to prevent him from getting canceled himself. Now, the Albany County Sheriff, Craig Apple, filed the misdemeanor complaint against Cuomo back in the fall. But there were inconsistencies in the state attorney general's report, which is uh, the actual document that ended Cuomo's career. They apparently got the dates of the alleged incident wrong. Joining us now is Dennis Vacco. He's the former Republican attorney general of New York State. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. So, Dennis, what do you think happened here? Dan, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh Look, I think that what happened is that the sheriff got out in front of his skis on this case. Uh, one thing that's missing from the filing that he uh, submitted to the court back in October was an affidavit from the victim. But more important than that is that he, he, he readily admits that he didn't coordinate with the DEA. And I think that's where his, his trouble uh, really began because in such a high profile, and the case is high profile uh, because of who the the target is the then sitting governor, uh, or at that time he was just recently re resigned as governor. But as a county sheriff, even though he's an elect independently elected official, you don't take on a case of this magnitude that's you know the subject of, of headlines, front page headlines every day without consulting with the duly elected district attorney whose responsibility is to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think that's where uh, Sheriff Apple uh, really got over his skis, as, as I said a moment ago. Have you ever heard of a sheriff in a big case or any law enforcement official in a big case filing a charge without the DA when the person knows that the DA is actively investigating the case at that time? It, it, it's it's mind-boggling to me that the sheriff did this. Um, it, we can only speculate as to what his motivation was and why why he did this, but the fact that and he so, somewhat cavalierly indicated in in a, a contemporaneous uh, news account of it that he didn't have time to talk to the DA. Well, you know he also says in the same um, uh, news article that that his investigators had been looking at the case for several weeks. You would think that at one point in time over the course of several weeks that somebody would have thought about calling up David Soros and saying, hey, what do you think about this? You know, you're, gonna, you're the guy that's going to have to prove this case. What more do you need? You know, how can we improve our, our investigation here? So here's the big question. Um, you know, he was charged. Andrew Cuomo has been charged. He has to appear in court on Friday. Is there any chance that the sheriff can kind of try to go on with this on his own? Well, <laughs> uh, with this sheriff, given his track record in this case, uh, anything is possible, I, I guess. But the fact of the matter is the DA has made it perfectly clear that he's moving to dismiss the case. And while it's still within the discretion of the court to accept that motion to dismiss, I fully expect the judge to grant it. The, the, the sheriff would run the risk of potentially contempt of court if he decided to refile the same complaint that the judge has just recently dismissed. He certainly can't prosecute it on his own. He needs the DA's office to, to conduct the, the prosecution, to present the evidence. So for all intents and purposes, in my estimation, if 
assuming the judge grants the motion to dismiss, this case is over. Why do you think that the sheriff did this? I know we don't know for sure, but what, any speculation? Well, it would be just that rank speculation. It is a, a bit of a head scratcher. Um, he is a duly elected official. Uh, interestingly, he's a Democrat. Uh, David Soros is a Democrat. So one would think that there would be, you know, just a, a, a more, um, you know, willingness to cooperate with one another. Um, I've read news accounts where he's been characterized as the Teflon sheriff. Uh, he's run unopposed. Uh, he got first elected in 2011 and has since then run opposed. So it's possible that, again, he just, for whatever reason, he, he, he bit off more than he could chew in this case. <laughs> All right. Probably smart not to speculate too much because we don't know exactly why he did. Although, you know, I speculated a little bit. Who knows? I mean, I, I, look yeah. at, I, I don't think that it was a, a conspiracy. You had mentioned perhaps uh, that, you know, he coordinated this with the uh, Letitia James, the attorney general. I don't think that that's the case at all here. Uh, who knows? I mean, he's been around Albany politics for a long time. We don't know what, when the last time he and Governor, ex-Governor Cuomo crossed paths in, in not so favorable fashion. Yeah, exactly. Dennis Vacco, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Next, the double standard of media bias playing out before our eyes. A popular Fox News host is getting slammed for being honest. That's next. Time now for our Media at Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull, the world of cable news and beyond. The political media world was all a flutter when Fox News' Jesse Waters admitted on air that, well, he's conservative and that he's openly pulling for progressive infighting. But do I feel sorry for Joe Biden? No. I work at Fox. I want to see disarray on the left. It's good for America. It's good for our ratings. This sort of honesty in the opinion media seems kind of refreshing to me. A bit of candor that makes the hot takes seem more authentic or at least transparent. But not everyone, particularly in the left-leaning media, received Waters' admission with the same level of appreciation. I mean, I'm, I'm just filing this under stuff we already knew, I guess. Yeah, it's the quiet part. He said the quiet part. CNN's New Day, not holding back. They're sort of disgust at Waters' comments. Essie Cup, who's usually one of the sober voices on CNN, went further in deriding her former Fox News colleague. What he just did is really articulate the sort of the three pillars of the new American right. Um, the first is that there are two Americas, not one. They're not interested in changing hearts and minds with ideas. And thirdly, um, ratings above all else. Uh, that's true at Fox, where certainly ratings have seemed to trump public health and safety and also like facts. Right, because CNN doesn't care about ratings, right? Ratings, what do we care about ratings? Let's start with the two Americas and the suggestion that it's a defining trait of just the right. That would ignore what we hear on left-leaning cable networks every day. I mean, yesterday, Representative Eric Swalwell said this on MSNBC. I'm worried that if Republicans uh, win in the midterm elections, uh, that voting as we know it in this country uh, will be gone. Uh, this is not only the most important election. Uh, if we don't get it right, it could be the last election. Now, you, you won't be surprised to learn that that doomsday scenario went unchallenged by MSNBC's Chris Hayes. And it's not just on cable news either. And the midterm elections, especially uh, if you have a significant uh, win uh, for a Trump-led Republican Party, means that 2024 is going to be seen as illegitimate. That was Ian Bremmer, CBS This Morning. And now this from Anna Navarro from The View. Look, I felt, I felt that Joe, Donald Trump had not been legitimately elected. I thought he'd gotten help from the Russians. All right, and that's after she had just complained about Trump's big lie. Look, it's not apples to apples, but you want to know why these pundits are saying these things to make them more popular or for, as Jesse Waters admitted, for ratings. There's bias on both sides, and it's toward partisan politics because it rates. Sure, Fox News bias, particularly at night, is over the top, but at least Jesse Waters is owning it and not pretending to be objective as so many on the left do. That's our wrap of the day's media bias buzz in the bull. Coming up, a bad day in court for Prince Andrew as he tries to get a sex assault lawsuit dismissed. 
But I want to know, if the case moves forward, could they, like, banish him from the kingdom? Meaning, what can they do if he becomes too much of an embarrassment? We'll ask a royal expert up next. I want to know, is there anything else the royal family could do if the case moves forward and Prince Andrew becomes even more of an embarrassment? Joining me now is Hillary Fordwich, a longtime observer of the British royals and an expert on the monarchy. Hillary, thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right. So give me a sense here. Is there anything else they can do apart from sort of removing him from official duties, which they've already done if this gets really ugly? Oh, yes, Dan, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, a few things here. Um, there's the Titles Deprivation Act from 1917 that actually removed the titles from four um, peers. Um, that was because they were German, and of course, 1917 during the First World War. So obviously, his title, the Duke of York, could be removed. However, what that takes, it's not actually up to the Queen. That takes an act of Parliament. That takes a statute which would be need, needed to be voted on by both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and then with the Queen's consent. Obviously, that it's like that in the US, we have the three different branches of government, they have the same in the UK. So the Duke of York title could theoretically be removed. Also, he currently holds nine honorary military titles, and the top brass in the military isn't happy at all about his conduct. In fact, he's been dubbed as toxic and that it's untenable, his behavior. Obviously, this does not reflect well on the military. Um, he has not been at any military events ever since this entire um, case has broken. And especially, you just mentioned, Dan, that ghastly interview uh, with Emily and the BBC um, back in 19, and he has not attended any military events since then. So yes, titles can be removed, his formal title, his military honor honorary titles. And also there has been some discussion also that he shan't attend any of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, which take place next June, uh, this June in 22, uh, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrating her 70 years on the throne. Of course, all of his other siblings will be there and other members of the royal family, but he won't be appearing on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. The other thing, of course, which could occur, and nothing's formal has been discussed, but it's been talked about, is some sort of exile for him. And of course, the <laughs> Queen very vividly remembers her uncle, Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor, who was exiled and lived out the rest of his life in France, mostly in Paris and sort of in the jet setting set. Um, similarly, I mean, that, that could happen. Prince Andrew currently in a YouGov gov poll, two factors that YouGov has uh, brought to light is that only 6% of the entire British population believes any of his story on that BBC interview, which won't come as a surprise to you or any of the viewers. And then he's now at the very bottom of all those ranked in the royal family. So his ratings have plummeted. Um, there isn't the belief in him. He used to be dubbed Randy Andy, and he was also um, dubbed actually Air Miles Andy because of all of his use of a private jet. So he hasn't been very popular with the British public for quite some time. Well, and you know, look, you know the way the royal family works, and you've just given us an, a detailed history. I know the way the legal system in the United States works, and the problem for him is going to be that if this case moves forward, there's going to be discovery, meaning that the plaintiff here, Virginia Dufre, whether you think her claim is legitimate or completely illegitimate, is irrelevant. If this moves forward, the discovery process means they're going to get a lot more dirt on Prince Andrew. And that's yes. why I'm having this discussion with you. And I've got to believe that makes a lot of people there very nervous. Absolutely. In fact, this is pure speculation. But, you know, many people have actually you know, speculated that, you know, this hasn't been good for the Queen's health. You know, stress isn't good for anyone. Uh, she is 95 years old. She loved she lost her beloved and very much loved um, husband, um, Prince Philip. And obviously, you know, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry aren't making life easy for her. And then this on top of it, coming in as a shadow over her Platinum Jubilee year, Yes, it's, it's very stressful and it's not good for any, the royal family any way you look at it. In fact, it, it, what's very sad, I think most, most British people think, and not that I can represent an entire nation, is that she has dedicated her entire life to doing the right and decent thing. And everyone in the UK sings the national anthem, you know, our, our, our gracious and noble queen. These actions are neither gracious nor noble. And he's very much damaged the image and, and all that the queen has stood for for the royal family.
We shall see uh, what happens next here. I expect a ruling will come soon. And yes. uh, based on the questions I heard from the judge today, I, I would not be betting on Prince Andrew. We shall see. Hillary Fordwich, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Pleasure, Dan. Next up, French Bulldogs. They're cute, but they're also part of a disturbing trend. Violent dog nappings around the nation. Thieves going to scary lengths to get their hands on the pricey pets. Violent dog nappings have become a nationwide issue. Many in broad daylight, where owners are attacked, in some cases even held at gunpoint. In particular, French bulldogs, which are not only popular, but very valuable, usually worth between 35 and 5,000 bucks. The dog nappings are happening across the country. Recent cases have been reported in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland area, New York's Long Island, Milwaukee, Chicago, Central Florida, Houston. This is unbelievable. Joining us now is Brandy Hunter, a Munden. Sorry, Brandy Hunter Munden. She's the VP of Communications with the American Kennel Club. Brandy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. So why is this happening so much right now? Well, the French Bulldog is a breed that has really risen in popularity in about the past 30 years or so. Right now, it's number two in the country on our most popular list, and in some cities, it's number one. It comes with a pretty high price tag, and the demand far outweighs the supply. But, I mean, it does seem like recently there have been more of this, right? I mean, in the last year or so, is it just that people, the thieves, have begun to realize, oh, you know what? Here's a valuable item we can steal right off the street that maybe they didn't know about before. That is absolutely part of it. And also the prevalence of social media, as well as the demand. You don't have a lot of puppies from a French bulldog litter. So when you're wanting a French bulldog, you're on a wait list nine times out of 10. And that makes it prime for thieves. They know how much they cost and they will access them by any means necessary. Now, we mentioned in the lead up to this, some stories of dogs being returned home to the owners. How often do you see that happening? It doesn't happen as much as we would like. There are cases where offering a reward brings them home far sooner than, you know, not offering a reward. But there are cases where they do come home and they do come home quickly. Are there other popular breeds that have been targeted? There are smaller breeds that are more portable, like a Shih Tzu, a Yorkie, Pomeranians. Those are dogs that are very easy for thieves to grab and make off with. So we do see a prevalence of theft in smaller breeds as opposed to larger breeds. It's kind of hard to snatch a German Shepherd off the street. So you do <laughs> right, see them in right. smaller breeds. Yeah, you're taking a bigger risk as well. So what kind of tips can yes. you give to someone who owns a, a French Bulldog or one of these other smaller dogs to to prevent them from becoming victims? Well, animal theft is a problem that has been around for a long time, but there are several things you can do. First and foremost, make sure your dog is microchipped and properly tagged. If they get away from their captor, somebody can contact you. If they do by chance end up in a shelter, the chip can be scanned and your information will come up and somebody can reach out to you. Make sure that you're being alert. I know we like to multitask, but when you're walking your dog and texting, you're not necessarily paying attention to what's around you. So you wanna make sure that you're actually focused on your surroundings. You don't have to always Look over your shoulder, but if you notice something suspicious, that's the way. You don't want to walk your dog off leash. No matter how trained your dog is, you don't have any recourse if somebody snatches your dog off the street. And never leave your dog unattended, even in your backyard. Thieves have targeted backyards on corner lots, easy access lots, and because you don't have your eyes on them, you really can't see what happens to your dog. And never outside of a store, never in your car. And if by chance your dog does get stolen, report it to authorities right away because it is a highly underreported crime. Yeah. All right. Brandy Hunter Munden, thank you. This is important uh, information and important tips. Appreciate you coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Up next, a man accused of assaulting his girlfriend makes a run for it. The handcuffs not stopping him. Talk about brazen. When he's caught, the fight isn't over. This explosive body cam video is coming up next with our friend Sean Larkin.
We're on scene tonight with newly released body cam video from the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office in New Mexico. Again, showing the dangers law enforcement officers face across the country. It starts with a chilling 911 call after a woman was attacked by her boyfriend at a gas station near Albuquerque. Then she called police after returning home. I'm not sure the apartment, but he's like walking around, so he's trying to look for me. So we need to get like an officer over here. And you're outside and he's inside. I want to make sure I have this correct. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure the apartment, but he's coming outside looking for me. He knows where I'm at. I'm afraid to even run in the dark right now because he might chase me. Okay. Stay on the line with me, okay, and keep me updated. Okay. We have officers headed that way. Does he have any weapons? I swear, go to that. Is that him that I hear? <laughs> Ma'am? What? Well, I'm sorry, I'm so scared right now. The victim said the suspect, Mario Diaz, had been drinking and was also on drugs. While deputies were talking to the woman, Diaz walked into the home. Let's see your hands, dude. Okay. Deputies handcuffed Diaz, but had to recuff him after removing his backpack. While Diaz was in the back of a patrol car, he was able to sneak his left hand out of the cuffs as he argued with one of the deputies. Get back in the car. No, I mean, I mean, come on, just bro. I got to bro. Get back in the car. Please, bro. No. What do you mean, no? Let me take a All right, now while Deputy Derek Gallegos struggled with the suspect, Deputy Taylor Feist, who was in the apartment with the victim, ran out to help. We're seeing synced up body cam video from both deputies. Deputy Feist deployed her taser and told the suspect to get on the ground, but he kept fighting. Please, let me go, please. Let me go. Let me go. Get off. I didn't do nothing. Get off. Listen to me. We're human. Huh? We're human. We're human. Let me go. As both deputies struggled with Diaz, Deputy Feist deployed her taser a second time. Cell phone video from a witness shows Deputy Gallegos, who was on the ground with Diaz on top of him, freeing himself, just as Deputy Feist says Diaz was reaching for her gun. Deputy Gallegos shot the suspect twice. Diaz died at the scene. This was the first time Deputy Gallegos had fired his weapon in the line of duty in three years with the department. The sheriff's office says it's not clear if the suspect was actually able to get his hands on the gun. That's really not the Point. The incident is still under investigation. Joining me now is Sean Sticks Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant. Uh, Sticks, good to see you. Um, all right, so this is already a sort of dangerous situation, and then the suspect gets out of the cuffs. Yeah, exactly. You know, domestic violence calls are, are, they're highly volatile. I mean, you've got a suspect and a victim. A lot of times the emotions are overflowing. And part of a domestic violence call you know, the suspect, it's all about this power. It's this control that they have over their victim. And so when a victim is called the police, the police show up and these guys are taken into custody or these guys or women, they're losing a part of themselves, essentially. They're losing that power that they usually have. And a lot of times it just spins them even further out of control. And then as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, our victim said that the suspect was on, uh, you know, alcohol as well as drugs. So those are obviously other factors. So they get him handcuffed and in the car. Um, you know, I don't know if it's some sort of a particular training issue that needs to be looked at on how he was able to get his hand out of a cuff. But either way, the suspect is the one that forced this situation. Um, you know, he's arrested for a crime. Escape, I think, in Arizona is a felony. You've got another crime. And then he continues to fight with the two deputies. Well, I want to watch that moment again because it's a little hard to see when the suspect is fighting with the deputies and then... One of the officers um, says that he grabs for her gun. Let's watch that again. Let me go. Get off. I didn't do nothing. Get off. Listen to me. We're human. Huh? We're human. We're human. Let me go. My dad's a gun. My dad's a gun. Shoot me. All right. So split second decision there, Sticks. Talk to me about that moment. 
Yeah, and it's the correct decision. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the person's already been arrested, has escaped, has now fought with two deputies, uh, you know, for about a minute. They actually tried two taser deployments on the person. And, you know, he's saying things like, please, please stop, let me go, I didn't do anything. So somebody just hearing this, not seeing what's going on, doesn't understand what's going on down on the ground. You know, anytime an officer is in a fight with a suspect, there is always at least one gun being, a, being the officer of the deputies. Here you've got two guns, both deputies. So so once that suspect uh, you know, transitions from resisting arrest or even just physically fighting to going for that weapon, that immediately escalates it to a deadly force type of scenario where the other officer is forced to use his firearm to end the situation. And the reason I think it's so important for people to see this kind of situation is something you just alluded to, right? Which is someone might see a moment, right? And they might say, oh my goodness, what happened in this moment? But what we've showed you is everything that happened from the 911 call, right? the victim talking about how scared she is, the cops walking yep. into the house and dealing with that moment. And it is this context that is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah absolutely. As I mentioned, just the audio alone, you know, uh, this takes place in an apartment complex. Somebody outside just hearing, you know, the guy saying, please, please, which is the suspect, you know, the, the guy that's been arrested who has tried to escape arrest. And he's like, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. And then an officer ends up shooting and killing him. Like, just as you, you, you mentioned, it's the, the context. Not everybody understands it. And that's why it's so important that body cam videos um, and, you know, in your show like this or something that shows the entire story of how something gets from point A to point B that sometimes has these type of results. It is, uh, it is critical. And that's why we do uh, this segment. Um, Sticks, before you go, I want to transition and ask you about something else or actually offer you a piece of advice, which is you may think that wearing glasses makes you look smarter, but actually... <laughs> You know, it just looks like you went to like a local drugstore and picked up a pair of those glasses and put them on, you know, to sort of add. There's not the even lenses in these, Dan. Not even lenses, yeah, yeah. man. It's all about fashion. <laughs> yeah. That and my yeah, and, Pearl and, Snap you know, shirt, buddy. Yeah, exactly. They look marvelous, the, uh, the glasses. Um, I didn't even thank know you, you wore you. glasses. I'm blind as a bat. Actually, my right eyes bother me tonight, so I had to take my contacts out and put my glasses in. So it shows you how much you paid attention to me the three years we worked together in New York. That's true. Well, I, I got to say, I never saw you in that entire time wear glasses, ever. I, I Nope. Uh, I, I rarely, rarely do it. But I honestly have been wearing contacts or glasses since I was about 18 or 19 years old. I, I cannot drive right. without them, I promise. All right, we had a little extra time here. You know, we can promote your book in the it background, nice. Breaking Blue. Um, so uh, it's nice to chat with you. Um, and uh, your it book, is. Breaking Blue, which uh, I was involved in publishing, I should disclose. Yes, sir. Um, is about People police officers falsely accused. Exactly, falsely accused of crimes. It's an interesting, uh, interesting take and an interesting book. All right, Sticks, that's up. That's it for our extra time. Talk to you soon. Let's do it again. All right. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime with Marnie Hughes starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.